So I'm Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. We're a nonprofit based here in Tucson, but we cover the entire U.S. Southwest, and uh, our magazine at least tries to cover the Mexican Northwest. And the theme of the series this year is, or this season, is about places that you really should experience. We've brought in people who know those places really well. They have a long-term experience with them and uh, want to share their connections to place with you. And you can uh, follow up uh, later this year, next year, sometime. Get these on your calendar as places to visit. Bears Ears. Um, it's been a place of deep controversy. It's a special place on the landscape there in southeastern Utah. It was a <laughs> proposed 1.9 million acre national monument. It was a, an established 1.35 million acre national monument uh, with a proclamation by President Obama in <coughs> late in uh, 2016, uh, December 28th of that year. And it's now uh, barely 15% of that because it was downsized by President Trump on December 4th of <laughs> 2017. Thank you. <laughs> so Ari Barillo, Ralph, um, is a great friend of Archaeology Southwest. He's actually employed up in Salt Lake City by South. SWCA uh, environmental consultants. Uh, at lunch today, he described how he's doing incredible numbers of archaeological surveys up in that uh, northern Utah, up in uh, even a little farther north. Uh, but he has extensive experience on the ground in southern Utah as well. And he's going to share with us both some of the research that he's been involved with, and because these places are, are special for a great variety of reasons from tribal connections to uh, the archaeological richness to the new research insights that they can provide. So uh, Ralph is going to touch on these things tonight and I'll turn it over to him and there will be an opportunity at the end. Uh, I'll run around with the microphone and let you ask questions and uh, we'll kick things off with Ralph. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Archaeology Southwest. Thank you, Smiths. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this is only the second time in my entire life I've ever given a public talk about research, conservation, or anything erudite where they serve beer, and I am tremendously happy about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to get into this as fast as possible. I've got two topics to cover. One of them, I'm going to hit you with a fire hose of research. Uh, hopefully, it won't go over anyone's head because of the way I deliver it. It's really fun and interesting, and it sets up the second half, which is a summary of the conservation battle, going back as far as I was willing to dig and right up until the present day. Now the research summary is this. It's what's called the Bears Ears Water, uh, the Bears Ears Water Project, started in 2013 myself. Doctoral advisor Joan Brenner Coltrane, Michael Lewis, my uh, friend of mine, and Bill Leip, who, if you don't know that name, you want to know anything about the Bears Ears area, archaeology, history, write it down. This, this I always try to include because I know that place so well I could navigate it with my eyes closed, which I don't advise. But to give people an idea of, of the landscape itself, this, by the way, is the, the boundary of the monument proposal in 2015 that I'll get to eventually. But this is the area we're talking about. It's southeastern Utah, this, the southeasternmost extent of Utah. And the reason I show this, well, it's twofold. One, because some people don't know where I'm talking about. I've never been there. I've had people, I'm not kidding about this, I've had people in Moab ask me where the Bears Ears is during the, while the controversy was starting to ramp up in 2016 and why they should care about it. Moab, by the way, is there. <laughs> the other reason, though, is because as archaeology has progressed as a science, we've, we, they, it has expanded its perspective in two directions. One, from focusing on, on artifacts, things, pots, stuff like, you know, treasures, Indiana Jones stuff, 
uh, upward and outward to the level of landscapes and considering the landscape uh, as a cultural element. At the same time, it's gone in the opposite direction, all the way down to the teeniest, tiniest constituent elements. And this is where our story begins. So for those of you who don't know, isotopes, which are the principal components of my research on the agricultural strategies of the ancestral Pueblo in the Bears Ears region, are variants of chemical elements that have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. In other words, they have varying weights. They're atoms of a certain element with varying weights. Usually they're heavier. They've got extra neutrons. Neutrons are neutral, so it doesn't change the nature of it, it just makes it heavier. They come in two flavors, unstable and stable. Unstable isotopes are isotopes with extra weight, that is to say extra neutrons. Uh, they can't carry it. They can't, you know, over time they become unbalanced. They end up throwing it off as radiation. These are also known, therefore, as radioisotopes. You pay attention to that. You calculate it. You count the amount of them that they throw off over time, and you can use that in certain circumstances to determine how old something is by how long it has been out of the car, something like, say, the carbon cycle. Uh, this is C14 dating, for example. Carbon-14 is a heavier element of the base carbon, uh, which is unstable. It loses the extra weight. Stable isotopes, on the other hand, are heavier elements that do not lose the extra weight, and therefore you cannot date them. And that never, ever comes out as anything but a bad joke. Uh, but the fact is, that the ratio of lighter to heavier elements, or of lighter to heavier stable isotopes, I should say, in any given ecosystem remains uh, static. They don't, they don't decay over time. So whatever forces created them, when you find them, you can backlog that and figure out what those conditions were. And what do I mean by that? Focusing specifically on oxygen, there are two useful oxygen isotopes in the natural ecosystem, oxygen-16 and oxygen-18, both stable, both don't decay. One of them, as you can see, is, is heavier than the other one. It's the heavier of the two stable isotopes. Now, I know as scientists, it's part of our job to try and make things sound more complicated than they are. And so an open rebellion of that, let me explain how stable isotope analysis works. Heavy things are harder to lift and more prone to fall down than light things. <laughs> Whereas light things, light things are easier to lift and they're less prone to fall down than heavy things. Now, have I lost anyone so far? That's stable isotope analysis. So, <clears throat> there is always a background uh, owing to principally to solar radiation and a few other factors that I don't really frankly understand, but there's always a background level of, uh, or background ratio of these things in the natural world. When they're acted upon by environmental factors, that gives you the ratio that you're looking at. So, because the heavier isotope of oxygen is heavier, harder to lift, you need more energy to lift it. Ergo, uh, it's, it's harder to evaporate it out of water. And climate scientists, several decades ago, recognized this and realized that because the lighter isotope is easier to lift, the heavier isotope is harder to lift. If you can figure out from one time to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, the amount of these two, uh, the ratio of the heavier to lighter isotope you find in water samples, you'll be able to determine how much energy there was in the air, ergo how hot it was. Think of, so think of this essentially like invisible weightlifters. You look and you see you know, nothing but light weights going up and down, up and down. You think, all right, yeah, I, I could take those. But, but if you see a bunch of heavy weights going up and down and up and down, you know that there is some strong stuff going on there. They applied this to ice cores. They continue to apply this to ice cores uh, as well as to marine shells. Anything where you can just, you can sort of ablate it, go backwards and look at the ratios over time and you can rebuild paleoclimates, and that's how play, uh, one of the ways paleoclimatology started, and it's the one, really the baseline one, that we continue to use to this day. And then in the 1980s, a number of researchers, principally Jim Ehrlichson and a fellow named Ken Peterson, University of Utah, 
which is how I know about them, came to the stunning discovery that trees don't move around a whole lot. <laughs> and, and thus they are unlikely to go and, for example, eat Mexican on one day and eat you know, Chinese food the next. They stay where they are. And so whatever water is incorporated into plant cellulose, cellulose includes water, it's one of the C-H-O-N, those are the principal you know, organic uh, elements. So whatever, whatever water that they're using for that oxygen component of their plant cellulose, they're getting from local sources because they can't send away for it. And since most trees, trees that behave, uh, form exactly one cellulose ring every year, which is how we're able to date them, if you take that same principle and apply it to tree rings and look at the ratio of heavy to light isotopes in the oxygen, in the cellulose of each successive tree ring going back in time, you can approximately recreate local climate. So local that it's down to the level of a tree. Uh, they tried, they succeeded. Uh, Ken Peterson, in fact, did this analysis on pinion trees, uh, I believe pinion trees, from the Bears Ears area itself, uh, right up where the Bears Ears are on top of Elk Ridge. And then we uh, that finally takes us to 2005 and to a team of people, including my uh, academic researcher, Joan Coltrane, who took all those things and put them together. Up in Utah, where the, one of the biggest questions is how were people able to farm? Because Utah's dry. And the Fremont were successful farmers right up until about the 1200s. The ancestral Pueblo were successful farmers right up until about the 1200s. Um, and so, uh, you know, a running question is how, why, where, how do you get a robust population of farmers in a place where until, you know, mass irrigation and, uh, and being able to, to truck in water like we do today, we weren't able to. And so what they did is this. They figured that, A, because snow forms at high cold altitudes, the oxygen isotope ratio is going to be very light because it's high, hard to lift, therefore lighter isotopes up high. Rainfall, on the other hand, occurs closer to the ground. Lower occurs during, water, uh, during summer, so it's warmer, lower, warmer, heavier. Put those together, and you have this, this idea that in any given environment, snow melt should, uh, the variation between snow melt and rain in those oxygen isotopes should be, uh, should be discernible. So you look at them using the same method that you know, Peterson and that gang were using to look at plant cellulose in tree rings. And you should be able to tell if they were drinking river water, which is to say uh, snow melt, which is to say irrigated, or if they were drinking rainwater, which is, you know, dry farming. It'd be a handy way to, it'd be a handy way to get at how they were able to farm in these extremely dry places. It'd also be a, a cheap way and a, a largely non-destructive way. That's another thing that archaeologists try to move toward with each successive generation. Uh, they tested it in the lab, but only in the lab. Uh, it was successful. This is called a proof of concept. They published, and on they went. And it is there, it is at that point in the story uh, that myself uh, and Michael Lewis uh, come in, because they'd never, they'd never tested it in the field anywhere. So this idea, this, this model's been sitting around since 2005, and there we were in the early 2010s, sitting around a campfire in Bears Ears trying to come up with some excuse to keep going back there over and over again. <laughs> and that's what we wanted, you know, how do we keep going back to this place? He ended up doing paleodietary reconstruction with Joan, uh, pulling together a, uh, a number of plant samples and then and going the, the carbon and, and nitrogen route. He suggested this to me. I got my funding, and we just kept going back and back and back and back and back. And so what we set out to test is this. Going back as early as the 1970s, Bill Leip mentioned earlier, and R.G. Matson, uh, real name Richard, so that replacing the first name with two initials goes, it's got a deep history in Southwest archaeology. Um, I got it from him. But what we set out to test is this. Matson and Leip, Looking at the fact that the Cedar Mesa area in particular, that's that central part of Bears Ears, uh, what most people associate with Bears Ears, has no reliable source of water, none. No standing water, there are no springs on top of the Mesa, there are down in some of the canyons, 
not enough to water a field. But very, very deep sandy soils. Uh, and they, so they combined that with a little bit of ecological knowledge with, and this is also of tremendous important, importance, ethnographic knowledge, talking, in other words, to Hopi farmers and saying, how would you do it? Uh, which is something that I think archaeologists need to do more and more. And they came up with this idea, this is the classic model, that uh, you plant deep maize seeds, plant deep in soils that are sandy, that have been snowed upon, and that are holding, because they're sandy and they're porous, they're holding on to, you know, uh, holding on to, to stored soil moisture from the melted snow. That should be able to, to germinate, crack, sprout the plant until the plant gets to the point where the, uh, the tasseling phase, where its water demands shoot up. And if you've timed it just right, that's when the monsoons should kick in. Monsoon cycle looks like this. Um, we know this really, really well up in Flagstaff, but just as a quick, as a quick blow through the, the, for about this region here, mostly the Colorado Plateau and a little bit south of there, uh, the precipitation regime over a given year is typically bimodal. During the winter, the Pacific jet stream dips down, carries storms across, kind of like a conveyor belt, drops a bunch of snow, you know, right around January. Summer, all this uh, hot, moist air in here, you know, heat rises, causes a reverse cyclone effect where everything comes in like this from the Sierra Madres, drags in moisture from the Sierra Madres, we get dumped on. Usually starting at about 4 o'clock on July 4th, just in time to ruin your barbecue, <laughs> if you're in Flagstaff anyway. And it goes for about a month, month and a half. So you plant, you know, you plant early enough, but you got it, and bear this in mind, this is important. In order for this to work, you'd have to time it just right to get it into the ground at just the right time to take advantage of that stored winter snow moisture just long enough without having to water it till right when the crops are reaching that, that critical tasseling point where they, they suddenly demand a lot more water, boom, this kicks in. And the best we could do really was to go out, collect a bunch of samples, and, and try to well, prove, you can't really prove things in science, don't tell the skeptics that, but support or fail to invalidate that hypothesis. But that was enough for us, because it was fun, it got us back in this wonderful place over and over again, and as you'll see, it, it spawned a whole lot of understanding. Um, and the reason I show this photo, by the way, is one of my, uh, one of my Hopi informants, when I was talking to, to them about, you know, how, how do you farm? How do you think your ancestors were farming? They said, well, which one of the things you want to look for are places where big sagebrush, uh, Artemisia tridentata, and rabbit brush, don't even ask me what its scientific name is, grow in big healthy stands together. One of them tells you about soil chemistry, the other one tells you about soil moisture. So if you see them together, plant your corn. That is what the top of Cedar Mesa looks like everywhere that there aren't buildings or cows. These are my funding sources. And from about 2013 to 2017, that was my involvement. That was what, that was my, that was my role in the Bears Ears area, was uh, going around with, uh, with permission from the Bureau of Land Management First, and then as we expanded from Cedar Mesa up onto Elk Ridge and the rest of what is now Bears Ears, uh, we also you know, had to get permission from the Forest Service to collect these things, to get our, our May cellulose. Went around, to, went around to Springs, we went out, I'm not kidding about this, went out and stood and captured rainwater a few times like that. Um, snow, everything. Just, just you know, hiking and collecting samples. What better science is there? And, uh, and it was during that time, and this, this little bit of the narrative is going to, this is where it spins off into, in fact, a book I've got coming out in September 2020, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, that was the beginnings of my involvement, my professional involvement down there, which grew into a role in the conservation battle. But here are the results, some of the results. First and foremost, uh, we were able to collect up 
you know, a good 20, 25 years worth of data on local climate in order to establish that yes, things do look and have for the most part looked just like this in the Bears Ears area about as far back as we can tell. It's bimodally distributed. So here's that, you know, the winter snow dump melts down into the soil. Here are the monsoons kicking in just in time to put out your fireworks. And over here, with a little bit of help from uh, NRCS, this is what the soil moisture column, or this is what the soil looks like in terms of, uh, in terms of stored moisture, especially in the sandy loams that you find on Cedar Mesa. They are at their highest in like April, May, starting in early June, and then way, uh, you know, going steeply way down in July, evapotranspiration, which means the combination of evaporation and plants sucking the water out makes it just disappear. So that's what those two, those are the, that's what the principal components of the environment look like. If you put them together with that earlier thing I showed you, in terms of, uh, that's a graph of water demand for maize plants. If you get them in the ground at exactly the right time to maximize the stored soil moisture while it's not raining or snowing during the driest part of the year is when the ground is its wettest. If you get it in just at the right time, right at this critical point where the maize starts to demand a whole lot more water, bam, that's when the monsoons kick in, feeds it the rest of the way, you get a successful crop. It's tricky, but it looks like, based on local environment, they could do it, so were they? And here's where the oxygen isotope analysis finally comes back to play. Uh, these are a collection of data points from the samples that we analyzed. Uh, I won't try to walk you through this because it's not only is it complicated, but I don't even fully understand it as much as I should. There's a lot going on with this, the, the relationship between oxygen isotopes and the local environment. But what, the, part, the part that really needs to be emphasized, though, is the simple one-to-one -one relationship between the ratio of oxygen, light to, uh, light to heavy oxygen isotopes in the plant cellulose and elevation. Because remember, heavy, hard to lift, light. So elevation really is everything when it comes to, uh, to direct rainfall. So when you put it all together like that, here are the results. It maps on with uh, a, a really statistically high uh, correlation. And that's, you know, we, we thought this was high enough to go, yay, we did it. We figured out that they were using direct rainfall, that this is what they were doing. Um, that whatever that last primary component of, of water that those plants were drinking was obviously direct rain, having been sprouted first and foremost in snow. This is what the formula shows us. Although there were a couple of major outliers, principally that one. We went back and looked at it, and we turned, it turned out there was a reservoir at that site, a prehistoric reservoir dug into the uh, partially dug and partially naturally occurring in the, in the sandstone. And so the water was sitting in that longer, and hence undergoing greater evaporation, hence being pulled this way. So you drop that outlier out, and it maps on even more tightly. So. What we did in a roundabout and, and, and convoluted but interesting sort of way is to prove Matson and Leip and their, you know, their Pueblo informants were right. Uh, we also were able to demonstrate the efficacy of our methodology. Yes, the method works. It can be applied elsewhere. If so, done, publish, and go get a drink. Except that that's never really how it works. Because along the way, so many complications piled out, just, just erupted out of this. As I said a second ago, it's easy to point out the simple one-to-one, -one, OK, so rainfall's this far, it's got this ratio, it maps onto elevation this way, therefore the corn looks like this, done. That's not how science ever really works. That's a cartoon that we draw out of it approximately, um, enough to support our hypothesis. But some of the more interesting complications, complications, I should put in quotes, uh, became some of the most interesting stories. And I'm only going to talk about three of them here because, uh, well, winter will end one day. But, but they are, I think, the three of the most interesting. 
One of them has to do directly with science, one has to do with the way people live on the landscape there, and one has to do with the fringe theory of archaeoastronomy. Altitude effect, to put it as simply as I can, is the effect of evaporation on rain as it falls from the cloud to the ground. I don't know how fast it travels. I should, but it depends on a few things like air density, how high, it up, uh, how high up it is. I know as a skydiver, my terminal velocity is about 200, 240 miles per hour, somewhere in there, um, rain. And we were getting hit like this going down through rain, so probably 100 miles per hour. I don't know. But there, it's not there for very long is the point. And so this was always taken to be negligible. When people use this, these oxygen isotopes, to reconstruct climate in, in plant cellulose in dry areas. Uh, if you look at their calculations in these published papers, they always say something like, oh, an altitude effect was, is a thing, and then they kind of brush it off, because it's taken to be about you know, 0.5 to 1.5 parts per mil per 1,000 meters, which, just trust me, it's negligible. That's not what we were seeing. What we were seeing looked more like this. It only takes a difference of 10 parts per mil, that's this, this symbol here. It only takes a difference of 10 to be able to tell if something is snow or rain. Uh, so these differences that we were finding at these different elevations were huge, way, way, way bigger than anything in the published literature. And it didn't take us long to figure out why. Because when people were studying rain, in order to, to determine essentially the baseline of this science, of this literature, if you're going to study rain, you're going to study it in a place where it rains. And, you know, if you study trees, you don't go to Antarctica. So, so the literature is biased away from places like Bears Ears that are high, hot, and dry, where dead air evaporation is going to be way higher. So what we were finding, these extreme, you know, this, this difference versus what's in the literature isn't included in the paleoclimate research that's been done in the Four Corners region using this method and applying it to tree, uh, tree rings, which means they all need to be looked at again. And it's possible that, uh, you know, and, and correlated with other sources, but, it, you know, it's possible the variability in the climate in the past was way higher than we thought. One. Two. Climate and storage technology. That's a silo, for those of you who don't know. Uh, by which I mean you're looking at a granary or a storage structure, which is the safer way to put it. Um, if you spend any time in the Bears Ears area, Grand Gulch, anywhere up in there, what you find is that, I don't know the exact ratio, uh, one day I'll figure it out, but something like nine out of every 10 structures that you find are not domestic structures, at least in the canyons. They're storage structures. Uh, granaries, uh, it's got to be at least an order of magnitude. I, I don't really, but it's, it's so many more. But they look like this. You'll find the same thing in some parts of the Fremont. In fact, in, in a lot of the Fremont world, what you'll find is the only structures that they were building in cliffs were these. Fremont never built, as far as we know, never built cliff, quote, dwellings. But looking a little more, you know, a little more closely at their nature, their distribution, uh, researchers, principally Berkeley Walker, who was a student and colleague of Bill Leip, along with others, uh, did some fancy calculation and figured out that if one of these of average size in the Bears Ears area was filled with, with presumably with dried maize, you could use it to feed or at least to buffer against starvation a family, a small family, for about three to five years. Now, most researchers agree that between 12 and 14, but generally speaking, 12 or greater inches of precipitation in any given calendar year is, is the minimum that you need to be able to grow corn, to grow maize. And so here again is the climate data, a section, about a 15-year section of the climate data from Cedar Mesa. If you don't see it, Mr. Happy Corn is here to help you. If you stretch that out, and, and I'm in the process of doing this because this actually, this part of it stopped in 2015, so we're past that now. But if you stretch this out as far as it goes in either direction, what you find is that this holds approximately. This strategy, this genius strategy that these folks worked out for, 
for growing maize in this waterless place works about every three to five years. So it all, you see how it all starts to fit together like a puzzle, as if these folks really, really knew what they were doing. Lastly, quantitative archaeology's favorite whipping boy, <laughs> archaeoastronomy, or the study of celestial markers and other astronomical phenomenon in the archaeological record. This is a uh, solstice marker, I think. In the realm of archaeoastronomy, in and around, but focusing mostly on the Bears Ears area, and I have Natalie Cunningham to thank for this data, these data. Um, the summer solstice accounts for most markers. I think that should say solstices, by the way. But at any rate, uh, equinoxes account for about a third. But then there's this last one, cross quarters. Solstices, it makes sense. If you picture you know, the calendar like a cross, the solstices, top and bottom, the longest day of the year, June 21st, the shortest day of the year, which was not that long ago, they're extremely important. They signal the changing of the seasons. Uh, a lot of very major holidays are located on those, Christmas being one. Um, same thing with the equinoxes. That, as the name implies, is when you know, the day and night is exactly equal, signals the turning of the seasons. But why these things? Cross quarters are the points on the calendar that are exactly halfway between the solstices and the equinoxes. And if it was just a in a few cases, you could you put it down to statistical, you know, wonkiness or, or, or some other factor besides, but 20% is pretty high. So for some reason, there are celestial markers. In other words, things that, you know, like a rock that casts a special shadow. That's what celestial markers are. Uh, about 20% of them signal for these things, these cross quarters. Why? What could possibly be so significant about those? Well, have a look at this again. If you are so aware of the local environment, so aware of the local landscape, aware of celestial phenomena, climatic phenomena, macro and micro environmental phenomena, etc. In other words, if you have total knowledge of your area and you want to be a successful farmer using a, a strategy that's as, as risky as the one that our data indicate that, that folks there, the ancestral Pueblo, were using, you've got to make sure you get it down to the minute. Um, or in a less exaggerative way, down to the day. But at any rate, if you get your maize seed in the ground too early, you're going to miss that target zone where the monsoons are. They're going to die. If it's even a week too late, it'll skip over it. The plants will still be thirsty when the rains end. They're going to die. So you need to get it in at exactly the right moment. And how do you do that? There are the cross quarters. So these folks had a knowledge of their landscape extending from canyon bottom to mountain top and all the way up into the heavens in terms of climate and environment that allowed them to successfully live in a place where I couldn't as a farmer. And their knowledge is expressed in just absolutely phenomenal ways, uh, up to and including astronomical ways. Speaking of which, why that landscape itself is so important. Um, this then is how, uh, and again in a narrative sense, this then is how I got involved in the conservation uh, of the area, having essentially jumped the gap from, from researching, from looking and looking and taking data and just analyzing it and then just doing things to it, uh, to giving back and trying to be part of that story and trying to work with and articulate with not only the landscape, but the people for whom the landscape is extremely important, who know it so well that they can look at the stars and go, OK, time to plant the corn and have it work. And so thus, we come to the story of the a, the a story, stories about uh, the conservation struggle in the Bears Ears area. This, by the way, this is comb wash. Uh, known as the sheep's testicles to the utes. I don't know why. But so in terms of early attempts, one of the earliest, I should put quotes around attempts, but I won't. Uh, Dr. T. Mitchell Pruden, a uh, friend of Richard Wetherill's, was there as, a, uh, as an archaeological enthusiast, which is to say looter, um, in the late, late 18 and early 1900s. 
but you know, a looter in the in the late 18, early 1900s sense. So not overtly malicious, just not realizing that they're being destructive. And in fact, he was one of the earliest people to go, well, there are these, these scientists, or at least pseudoscientists, people who do scientific sort of things anyway over here who are at least respectful and take good notes and so forth. And then there's these other folks. And he was one of the first to recognize that there's a difference between them and actually wrote about it and published about it in 1903. Having said this, and I hope by now that some of you have had a chance to read it. This, by the way, this, uh, this organization of, of sites is called a prudent unit. It's named after him. He wasn't an archaeologist. He was a doctor in the, you know, open up and say ah sense. But he was still uh, such a big figure in this area that, the, you know, that this unit Pueblo essentially is named after him. We find them all over the place. A little later that same decade, this is, uh, as I said, the two letters replacing a name goes back a long way. So this would be A.V. Kidder, or Ted, as Steve Lexon tells me he's called. This appears in a, a publication that came out in 1908, I want to say. But it was from the 1906 to 1907 field season. A.V. Kidder was working in the Bears Ears area, uh, principally the Alkali Ridge area. And in his report, which you can find, uh, you can still buy it, but you can find it digitized online, he laments the destruction of sites on, on Elk Ridge by what he called, quote, relic seekers. Um, so this was an early archaeologist. And early archaeology was, for lack of a better term, relic seeking. But even then, this was, this was the beginnings of, of, of our science, of this science starting to, to calcify around this idea that there's a way to do this that's not overtly destructive, not overtly disrespectful. Maybe we should focus on that. Maybe these people who don't do that are bastards. And he was, these were some of the earliest voices. By 1910, I skipped over something pretty important in there, by the way, but I'll come back to it. Uh, by 1910, Dean Byron Cummings of the University of Utah was decrying the theft of antiquities, the looting that he saw when he went on a series of momentous journeys. This is Dr. C uh, Cummings, right? Dean Cummings right here. John Wetherill, Richard Wetherill's brother, who is uniquely obsessed with conservation to his right, camera left, and then to the side there uh, is a fellow named Jim Mike, AKA Mike's boy. If you pick up the Bears Ears issue of Archaeology Southwest, uh, Jay Willen and Winston Hurst have a cool story in there about that guy. But anyway, uh, he started to really ramp up the public, uh, the public outcry against looting, against grave robbing um, in that area. And this is, uh, this is one of my favorite clippings because it's just, it's journalism at its absolute best. This is from the, the Salt Lake Herald, the precursor of the Salt Lake Tribune. Dean comes from scene, robbery of ruins has been stopped. 2010, so problem solved, right? And it's never happened since. <laughs> Obviously far from true, but shifting to a larger perspective as early as 1935, uh, there was an effort making its way through Congress to designate a, a national monument, not on its own, this is weird and quirky, but not on its own, but as a travel corridor for a national park that was being proposed in Wayne County called, and I'm not making this up, Wayne Wonderland. And Wayne Wonderland, it just, it was, it charged the head like a, like a train. And even, you know, the local voices that are typically opposed to that sort of, uh, you know, heavy handed federal presence, they were all in favor of Wayne Wonderland. Um, I don't know why, why they liked that, but not, you know, this piece of land between Wayne Wonderland and, you know, the major highway corridor here in the state of Colorado and then over here, Mesa Verde, was seen as being really special worth its own in terms of, of tourism, in terms of people going and seeing pretty things, archeological relics, trees, bears, and so forth. So we should protect that too, but they didn't want it to protect it to the same extent that, that you protect legislatively a national park. National park is as protective as it gets. You're not even allowed to pick up a rock and carry it out of a national park. Uh, national monument, way more lax. Um, so that was what the, the, the Escalani proposal was. Wayne Wonderland ended up happening. You've never heard of it because it was given the far less ridiculous title of Capitol Reef. But, yep, that's Capitol Reef. 
Uh, but that's, you know, Wayne Wonderland went through. This did not. And the reason that this did not primarily is because of World War II. Um, it was on its way. It was moving through. World War II happened by the time the war was over. This had been tabled, scrapped, kicked under so many chairs that it just never, it was never able to, to breathe again. But Bears Ears is this part of it. It would have accomplished the same goal that we are still trying to accomplish now. Between that and the 1960s, there were numerous attempts to expand Natural Bridges National Monument, which is here. This map is from the 1960s, by the way, to include, you know, all the way over to, uh, this is called Arch Canyon and on down to portions of Cedar Mesa. In other words, to try to protect at least a chunk of what is now the Bears Ears area in Cedar Mesa. And they didn't really, none of them really landed. And so that, as briefly as I can put it, is a, a brief history of all the, the many and varied attempts uh, by white individuals to protect the place to varying extents of no success. Meanwhile, and I don't really have slides to show this, but it's, it's, so it's more of a story. But the indigenous community never really stopped caring either. The tribes, the, uh, the Native American community. As early as 1968, uh, when Robert Kennedy was running for president, the tribes in the Bears Ears area uh, invited Robert Kennedy to bluff to try and convince him to do something to try and stymie the looting the rampant, you know, grave robbing, the destruction of sites that was taking place in the Bears Ears area. Uh, he, of course, didn't become president. That went nowhere. Um, but that's an example. That was happening. And the tribes never really stopped, you know, they, they never stopped to the extent that they, that they could, you know, trying to advocate for the protection of this place uh, from rampant development and from looting. In 2010, a group called Utah Diné Bikea, Diné is uh, essentially, it, it's Navajo for Navajo, it's their word for themselves. Navajo is an, a, a Spanishization of a Tewa word, uh, meaning farmers in the valley. But anyway, Utah Diné Bikea kicked off a, a project starting in 2010 where they went around to different tribal members of all these tribes that are, are affiliated ancestrally with this area to find out what places are most sacred to them, what places appear most in their cultural narratives, if so, why, what, how would they like them to be treated. It was a, a magnificent effort. It took about f almost five years. Just going to back, many of these places, uh, these folks didn't even speak English. But way into the back, in the, like the Navajo Nation, and out into the, you know, the Ute Mountain Utes and so forth, pulling together all these data, and eventually it ended up with a map. And the map was approximately this. It's the outer portion that's the blue. Um, the southern portion, meanwhile, the portion with uh, cross hatching, this was a, a separate Diné proposal for a national conservation area surrounding Cedar Mesa. And then there was yet another proposal by Friends of Cedar Mesa uh, for a greater Cedar Mesa national conservation area, which would be about this size. And then there was yet another proposal by Southern Utah Wilderness Society that had been sort of simmering for a number of years to complete canyon lands, which would essentially look like this. But then in 2015, uh, FCM facilitated the, you know, the tribes, these five tribes coming together along with Utah Dinebekea to create a, the first ever coalition of Native American communities, Native American tribes in North America which ancestrally don't always get along, to set aside their differences, come together as an, uh, a coalition, and, and put their weight behind Utah Diné Bikea's map. This is what needs to be protected. This is what's of greatest importance. We're all coming together on that one point. FCM, recognizing that that's where the, the waters were turning, dropped their proposal, jumped on board as, a, as supporters. So did Grand Canyon Trust, so did SUA the Greater Canyonlands folks, Hopi tribe. Crow Canyon followed up in 2016 by gathering, essentially by getting the, the bulk of the archeological community to jump on that same bandwagon and try to move it forward. And this then was the creation of the, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. And here was the result. 
As Bill pointed out already, designated in, on December 28th, 2016, this is Bears Ears National Monument. This is a handout that I put together for Archaeology Southwest when it happened. Again, like at the end of my research, again, cool story, bro. Send it to the publisher, let's go get a beer. But again, complications immediately erupted. This being the biggest one. Overvisitation is a problem. This, by the way, is the trailhead to a place in the Escalante area. I show it because the first time I went there, I parked my truck behind, I think, this tree right here and then lost it because it was just so overgrown. Now, this is how quickly, you know, once things get out, once they become popular. But the reason I mention this first, first and foremost amongst the list of challenges is because the monument is both a response to this problem and an exacerbation of the problem. From the years 2005, no, from the years 1995 to 2005, visitation in the Cedar Mesa area tripled. From 2005 to 2014, it tripled again. From 2014 to 2016, it tripled again. That is the literal definition of exponential growth. Um, and just to tell you, uh, because this is how I like to tell, tell history is through stories, just to give you a quick anecdote. Um, this is a, an archaeological site located in, in Bears Ears. Um, I don't know the name of it, but I think it's called Step Ruin for this reason. Um, these steps, these were mortared in there in you know, the 11, maybe the early 1200s. This thing is clinging to this rock. It's at about that angle. So it's clinging to the rock sheerly by gravity downward gravity as opposed to sloping gravity. Um, stepping on those would be damn near suicidal. And I went there in 2014, I went there and visited uh, you know, from outside taking photos with a friend of mine and there were some folks up inside the structure. How they'd gotten up there, I don't know. I think they stood on each other's shoulders, pushed each other up, climbed over the wall by grabbing onto the wall. And I called up to these individuals, these young men, of course they were young men. Uh, Let's be honest here. And said, I, you know, I don't want to go up there and join you because it's dangerous to me, it's dangerous to the structure, and it's illegal. But can you take some photos for me? <laughs> and they went, sure, bro. And I threw my camera, I'm not kidding, I threw my camera, uh, and they took this picture of themselves inside this structure. Uh, there were four of them tossed the camera back down to me. So all those cop shows you show where people get, go through all these crazy you know, motions to try to get underground and, and get you know, undercover and go infiltrate, forget it. You want to get the bad guys, just go, hey, bro, take a selfie for me. They'll do it. Um, but that's, you know, that's what you're up against there. At the same time, if people don't know that there's anything they're worth protecting, they're not going to try to protect it. So you're aiming for this, this seemingly impossible balance between if nobody knows it's there, they're not going to lift a finger to legislatively protect it. If everybody knows it's there, they're going to stomp all over it and destroy it. And so the balance you need to aim for is visiting with respect. Go and see it, but see it right. Um, there's a whole, whole two-page spread on, how, on visiting with respect in the, uh, the Bears Ears issue. Um, the Bears Ears Education Center has a whole thing about it. So does the King Gulch Ranger Station. Uh, go and see it. Go and see it right. Don't go off the trail. Don't bring your dogs to sites. Don't eat lunch in sites. Keep your sticky fingers away from, you know. But that's, it, it, it's, an, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge. It's a challenge that I don't think will ever be resolved because people need to know this stuff. They need to know there's something they're worth protecting. We can't tell them where everything is. Everyone's going to go and destroy it. You've got to aim for that balance. Um, and that's where groups like Friends of Cedar Mesa, Archaeology Southwest are just invaluable because they spread that narrative. Where to go, how to go there. This is the other challenge. Protests immediately erupted. This was taken in uh, Monticello. The locals, having lived there for a while, I, let me just say that local individuals in, uh, you know, folks living in San Juan County don't want the place destroyed either. They just, they're more in favor of Local, uh, local preservation, local management, things like that. They're not, they're not anti-protection, they're anti-federal. 
I disagree, but they make some good arguments. I, so I, I really want to just not paint the locals in San Juan County as villains. They're not. They just they they have reasons to be distrustful of the federal government there. Um, nonetheless, the crux of the problem is this: the Antiquities Act gives presidents the ability to declare emphasis declare, which is to say, set aside certain objects, places, valuable for scientific, cultural, or historic reasons, which are to be confined to the smallest area compatible. So here's the challenge. People who think that the creation of Bears Ears National Monument at 1.35 million acres is too big, lean on this one. People who say, too bad, it was done, it can't be undone, lean on this one. Two different statements in one piece of law, and that is where uh, the challenge, not only the challenge to the monument itself, but thus the challenge to the reduction of the monument uh, hinges. You can probably guess where I land. As soon as, the, uh, as soon as it became clear that the Trump administration was going to move to reduce the monument uh, before Grand Staircase was even part of the, the narrative, um, Patagonia along with REI and a few others, but principally Patagonia reacted by uh, protesting the Utah legislation and the Utah state government by pulling out the outdoor retailer show, which was biennially held in Salt Lake City, brought in millions of dollars, and, uh, and farming it out to, uh, to competing cities to try and you know, say essentially this could, be the re this could be the recreation capital, but you're in insisting on making Utah the uh, development and extraction capital. The state governor, state governor called it a tantrum, which it was, but a justified one. I voted for Flagstaff, and, uh, and then I remember they don't even have a Trader Joe's. <laughs> so, and we've been trying, we've been trying for years. So I don't remember Tucson throwing in a bid, but they may have, but anyway, it landed in Denver. So go to, the, go to Denver, that, the, the outdoor retailer show is awesome. So the following summer, as it, was, it became very clear that what we were up against, uh, myself and this handsome devil here, uh, Ben Bellarado is unfortunately unable to make it, but he's a local fellow, doctoral candidate at the U of A, uh, teamed up as co-editors for an issue of Archaeology Southwest magazine focusing on Bears Ears. And that's the one that you'll find at the front. I think we're giving you that one away for free at this because it, it's, it's so so far out now, but boy, it was that was about a year, year and a half of our lives. It was a lot of fun. But at the same time, Patagonia, principally along with Conservation Lands Foundation as funders and a few others, hired us two along with Bill Leip and a few others uh, to work together on, on a lawsuit, a preemptive lawsuit against the reduction of the monument that we were pretty sure was coming. What we worked on what we did for the lawsuit was pull together a, uh, a detailed quantitative data set. In other words, a report to accompany the lawsuit. The law itself was to be parsed by these lawyers. Um, it's about as far down that rabbit hole as I want to go. But talking to, the, uh, talking to the lawyer, my consulting lawyer the other day, um, we weren't allowed to talk about it while we were working on it because we didn't. it was supposed to work like a secret weapon. As soon as Trump attacks the monument, boom, it blows up in his face. Um, now that the reduction has happened, the lawsuit's been launched, I can talk about it. I just don't want to take up all your time. But we spent about a year on this, too. So we were really ramping up toward it. So when these two things came together, you know, working on, this, on the defense of the National Monument, as well as working on pulling together this magazine that was going to act as an edited volume on the history and archaeology of the place, uh, it resulted in, among other things, an experts meeting down in Bluff uh, where we were able to, to pull together just this tremendous group of all, probably all the greatest living researchers in that area. Um, everyone who's all the, the players you've seen, a few of the people that are here tonight, uh, we, and we talked about the archaeology of the place and the history of the place at a landscape level, which is what all my research was leading up to what Ben's research, Bill's research, everything was leading up to. This place was never not important. People were living here during the archaic period because of the resources they were targeting, here during the Basket Maker 3 period because of how the weather had shifted. 
at, from one time to another, to another, to another, to another, the place is like a mosaic. People were using one part of the landscape or another. It never fell out of importance. And so the entire place needs to be regarded with respect. It needs to be protected. And instead, this is what we've currently got. But this is what it currently looks like. This line on top comes from Bill Dole. And I think it's lovely. I think it's a lovely sentiment. <laughs> but this was, I think, January 4th, I want to say, December 4th. Anyway, about a year after the monument was designated, this is what uh, the Trump administration did to it. This was the response. The lawsuit launched. This was, and it's, and it's ongoing to this day. Judge Donia Chutkin of the Ninth District Court of Appeals ruled in October that no, the federal government can't just toss it out because it's important. Why try? A year earlier had ruled that, uh, you know, not only will the case go forward, but that any development planned, not even enacted, but planned, any development plan, new leasing, new drilling, and so on, within the original monument boundaries of both Bears Ears and Grand Staircase needs to be disclosed to the plaintiffs in the case. Um, so it's moving slowly, but it's moving. Lawsuits are still alive. And we'll probably be hearing some developments on that real soon. But to go back to Bears Ears itself, and just to bring things to a close, times continue to change. Things continue to develop there in really, really interesting ways. Um, Bluff. The city of Bluff was, or city, eh. it's a city of 300 people, if you count dogs. It's uh, the town of Bluff, which was ostensibly founded in about 1879, 1880, uh, when the Hole in the Rock LDS people arrived, figured out you can't farm there, and then left. Didn't become an officially incorporated town until last year. Um, sorry, two years ago. I keep forgetting we're in 2020 now. Uh, but it took 137 years. But now, you know, for the first time in history, they've got they've got a mayor, they've got a city council. They can, you know, they can make a lot. They can make their own decisions with a lot more autonomy without the the, the state government and especially without the county commission, the county government saying you will do this. Um, Bluff is at the foot of the Bears Ears and is comprised of way more conservationists, artists, archaeologists, and weirdos than the rest of San Juan County. And so those are the people I think that care the most, and they need to have that voice. And speaking of voices, and this is the last point, after years and years and years of litigation, uh, the Navajo, principally the Navajo Nation, but co-litigants as well, finally won a major case just back in, uh, at, at about the same time, at the tail end of 2017, overturning years of gerrymandering, as a result of which, despite the fact that indigenous individuals make up six, between 60 and 66 percent of the population of San Juan County, their vote counted for, I don't know, 10 percent maybe? Um, I'm exaggerating, probably more like a third, but the point is way less than it should have. That's how gerrymandering works. Uh, it was finally overturned. And wouldn't you know it, they voted for a new county commission immediately, and now it's two-thirds Navajo. So it's actually representative of, of the community, of the, the demographics of the community. In other words, the indigenous community in the Bears Ears area has a voice for now. It's, it was immediately challenged. Uh, attempts to re-gerrymander the area, which were overturned with prejudice, overturned with the ten, uh, by the 10th District Court of Appeals. So other efforts are ramping up. You know, they're not going to stop. They, the forces opposed to this, are not going to stop opposing it. But for right now, things are looking better. And so there's reasons to hope. And that brings us to the end. Questions? Thank you, Ralph. I'll bring the microphone around to people. I just did want to underscore one thing that over-visitation point is a good one. The Friends of Cedar Mesa have created the Bears Ears Education Center, uh, BEAK, and it's a place that is trying to uh, get across that visit with respect 
perspective. And it's right there on the main street, which is uh, there in Bluff. And I'd still encourage all of you to get it on your list and get out there. Questions? Was Cedar Mesa the limit of where you could farm, or was there an advantage of being higher up in that climate? Hang on one second, and I'll be able to answer that. But the only slightly answer is it depended on the weather. Um, so what you're looking at here, Cedar Mesa, oh, so by the way, so here's Bluff. This is the place I was talking about, Bluff. Um, this is where Friends of Cedar Mesa is based out of. They actually bought a defunct bar. Um, been defunct for decades. It was a bar, it was a rowdy bar. Was ended, it, 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 you don't need to know stories about the bar, but the point is, um, and you wouldn't believe them anyway. But they lost their liquor license, it was turned into an art gallery, and then Friends of Cedar Mesa bought it about two years ago with a tremendous amount of, of funding, turned it into the Bears Ears Education Center. So you'll find that here. Um, worth a visit, really cool place. But anyway, uh, the top of Cedar Mesa is right around 7,000 feet. Am I right about that? Between six and 7,000 feet at any rate. Um, and this is uh, Elk Ridge, which is the, the next highest landform. It's a, a smaller mesa that sits sort of above Cedar Mesa. It's where the Bears Ears Buttes themselves are actually located. It's about 1,000 feet higher. And here's, you know, this is Comb Ridge, that picture I showed you earlier, and this is Comb Wash down here. It's about 1,000, between 500 and 1,000 feet lower. So. Uh, as the climate shifted, the, the best place to farm would shift with it. Um, if you were going through a drought, typically uh, drought is characterized by places of, of sort of middling, you know, average, quote unquote, average temperatures becoming too hot. What, is, what, what do the animals do? They go, exactly, exactly. They go up. And the farmers figured that out and followed them. So when things got hotter and hotter, as the climate shifted that way, as it did in, 18, uh, in 880 AD, again in 1100 AD, uh, yet again in 1250 AD, I think everyone just said, you know, screw it and left. But, um, you know, in times when, that, when the, the temperature shifted up, they would literally shift up with it. And during those, so like the early, the P1 period, for example, so about seven, roughly 700 AD to about 900 AD, Everyone was farming up here. When things took a, a dive in the other direction, it became really, really moist, cold, and go down. Um, you know, places like Comb Wash. And so, really, they were they would follow they would follow ecological niches around this entire area based on how the weather was doing. And they'd always be able to find if it wasn't good to farm here during this time, go over here. And when you look during those periods, that's where you find them. Questions in this upper area? No, I guess this thing's going. Anyway. So what are the developments that are being proposed and the mining that's being proposed, which is the reason why it was being cut back in the first place? Yeah, that's tricky. So um, there's a copper mine that wants to expand in San Juan County right now. That's, this just popped up within the last week or two. It's ugly, it's controversial. It's also not in the Bears Ears Monument area. Uh, the simple and complicated fact of the matter is none. Um, there's really no coal there to speak of. Uh, there is natural gas, most of it is to the east of the Bears Ears National Monument area, so that was never a factor. Uh, uranium development could be done there ostensibly, but it'd be way too expensive. Um, it was really, all, it was more about control all along. Um, lobbyists, I have a friend who's married to a lobbyist, so the, the way this was described to me is lobbyists have a very, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your sort of uh, relationship with each other, and in, in the development sector, apparently that is, that is true in spades. Um, because Grand Staircase has a lot of development potential. There's a ton of coal under the Kuiperowitz unit, just to name one. Uh, there is a defunct copper mine there owned by, I believe, a Canadian company that they want to get back going. So there's a lot of development potential in the Grand Staircase area. And what it looks like is, you know, folks, folks basically came together and I will help fight your battle if you'll help fight mine. And so the uranium 
And there is, a, there is a mill. In fact, the last operating uranium mill in America is located right outside the Ute Reservation, because of course that's where they always stick those things, um, is in the Bears Ears area. Uh, so the uranium lobby fighting against the designation of the monument might have something to do with them being allowed to cart uranium through that area on trucks, poisoning all you know, white and indigenous folks alike. But more, it seems more likely than not that, that the energy companies that can develop Grand Staircase were simply helping in this fight so that the people in Bears Ears that just don't want federal control would help them in theirs. So Grand Staircase is in far greater danger of development. Bears Ears, I think it was just more about control. I think it was uh, two th 2017, Secretary Zinke went up there and did an evaluation. He talked to a lot of local people. And, and uh, do, you, do you have access to the report that he made after he visited uh, that section of Utah? And uh, what did he say in terms of justifying uh, rolling back the, the boundaries? Um, that report is, uh, well, there's two answers to that. One, that report was immediately uh, re released. Um, at the conclusion of the, the monument review, the flip side of that coin being it was immediately redacted. Um, so what Ryan Zinke did is uh, he went around ostensibly asking uh, members of the local community around Bears Ears and Grand Staircase and Gold Butte and a number of other places targeting areas where national monuments of 100,000 acres or greater were designated uh, by presidents 1996 or later, uh, which makes for a really narrow target area, and for very good reason. Um, he, did speak, he did speak with a lot of the local folks, but he, uh, there was also a comment period, a public comment period, which took about 25 days for Bears Ears, maybe 30, but still, no, it was uh, 15. Anyway, it was abysmally short co uh, public comment period, um, during which a record number of public comments came in. All of the public comments strongly, strongly supported leaving the monument the way it was. Zinke's findings were that members of the local community, uh, principally, especially uh, local ranchers, grazers, those sort of folks, uh, considered it federal overreach. They didn't like the precedent that it set. Um, and they argued, they, they, they primarily argued, or at least Zinke argued on their behalf, primarily on that point about smallest, you know, smallest unit for the effective management of whatever the thing is that needs protecting. Um, what they were arguing for was that the Antiquities Act, as it was written, it was written to protect, like, you know, a special tree or a waterfall or, you know what I mean? And one of the things that Zinke said by, in almost these exact words in his report, is that it was never intended to be used for landscapes. Um, I mean, as an opinion, I would call that a valid opinion um, if you want to interpret the law that way. But you can, inter you can just as easily flip that over and say, well, why not? Because it's a, a landscape, as you can see, can very much be a thing of scientific, historic, or cultural value. So why wouldn't it? So it hinged a lot on that. Um, he didn't think that the Antiquities Act was, was designed to protect landscapes so much as, as smaller, discrete objects, like archaeological sites, things, et cetera. Um, local, a lot of local people agreed with him. Can I ask you, uh, uh, could this have gone through Congress, or could it still go through Congress and get congressional approval? Um, <laughs> we, we were talking about that just today. Um, so yes, A short answer, yes. The, the Constitution of the United States gives gives the power, uh, gives control, I should say, of the public sector, of public lands to Congress. Control of the public sector is in the hands of the legislative, um, legislative branch. 
the Antiquities Act gives this much of that power over public lands from, from the legislative to the executive. This much, a tiny, tiny little amount. Um, and despite the fact that uh, you know, critics of the Antiquities Act say that it, it, it is either designed for or at any rate uh, precipitates uh, over, over use, federal overreach. In other words, that it, it's, you, you can take it too grandly. Um, expanding, that ex, uh, expanding its interpretation to include not only designating but undesignating land is actually an expansion of that power. Um, it doesn't rein that power in. It expands it. And I've heard a few uh, members of Congress argue against this. In fact, uh, right after the big, you know, the, the midterm election, when uh, Grijalva replaced Bob Bishop and, and the House, I think it's the, the Public Lands Committee. I forget exactly what the committee is called. But anyway, replaced Bob Bishop. Uh, no sooner had that happened than he began an investigation into the review. So he started reviewing the review to see if it was unethical. And Deb Holland, one of the two first ever Native American women elected to Congress, also in November 2018, immediately co-sponsored a bill to overturn the reduction, to codify the original Bears Ears National Monument uh, for a number of reasons, one being Native American, she's uh, personally invested in there, but two, um, this, the precedent that's set by, by this tiny bit of power being given to the executive being expanded to not only create but to destroy uh, is dangerous, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, because whoever's in the White House next can use it too. And, the, and I think the legislative understands that, and uh, rumblings from Congress it, it, it indicate that they understand that, and that maybe it, it could be they're simply waiting for there to not be someone sitting in the executive branch who can veto it, or maybe it's a matter of waiting for one of these bills to make it through, but Congress could at any time, because they're the ones that have, ultimately they're the ones that have final say over public lands. I mean, even national monuments. Congress has the ability to reduce them. Can we squeeze one more question in? Is there one? But just to follow up on uh, Ralph's last comment there, on our website, we have a video, um, Rebecca Strom, Re excuse me, Rebecca uh, Robinson and um, Stephen Strom did a Sunday tea for us and it's, they, it's on, on video. It shows some of the complexity of the folks on that landscape um, in the southeastern Utah area and they've highlighted some of those. It's a really complex topic, and I think Ralph has done a great job of, of giving you an overview on this, and let's give him another round, and thank you, Ralph, very much. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming, everyone.